This do in remembrance of me. 1 Corinthians 11.24 It seems, then, that Christians may forget Christ. The text implies the possibility of forgetfulness concerning him whom gratitude and affection should constrain them to remember. There could be no need for this loving exhortation if there were not a fearful supposition that our memories might prove treacherous and our remembrance superficial in its character or changing in its nature. Nor is this a bare supposition. It is, alas, too well confirmed in our experience, not as a possibility, but as a lamentable fact. It seems, at first sight, too gross a crime to lay at the door of converted men. It appears almost impossible that those who have been redeemed by the blood of the dying Lamb should ever forget their ransomer, that those who have been loved with an everlasting love by the eternal Son of God should ever forget that Son. But, if startling to the ear, it is, alas, too apparent to the eye to allow us to deny the fact. Forget him who ne'er forgot us? Forget him who poured his blood forth for our sins? Forget him who loved us even to the death? Can it be possible? Yes, it is not only possible, but conscience confesses that it is too sadly a fault of all of us that we can remember anything except Christ. The object which we should make the monarch of our hearts is the very thing we are most inclined to forget. Where one would think that memory would linger and unmindfulness would be an unknown intruder, that is the very spot which is desecrated by the feet of forgetfulness, and the place where memory too seldom looks. I appeal to the conscience of every Christian here. Can you deny the truth of what I utter? Do you not find yourselves forgetful of Jesus? Some creature steals away your heart, and you are unmindful of him upon whom your affection ought to be set? Some earthly business engrosses your attention when you should have your eyes steadily fixed upon the cross? It is the incessant round of world, 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 the constant din of earth, 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 that takes away the soul from Christ. Oh, my friends, it is not too sadly true that we can recollect anything but Christ and forget nothing so easy as him whom we ought to remember. While memory will preserve a poisoned weed, it suffers the rose of Sharon to wither. The cause of this is very apparent. It lies in one or two facts. We forget Christ because regenerate persons as we really are, still corruption and death remain even in the regenerate. We forget him because we carry about with us the old Adam of sin and death. If we were purely newborn creatures, we would never forget the name of him whom we love. If we were entirely regenerated beings, we should sit down and meditate on what our Savior did and suffered. All he is, all he has gloriously promised to perform, and never would our roving affections stray, but centered, nailed, fixed, eternally to one object. We should continually contemplate the death and sufferings of our Lord. But alas, we have a worm house in the heart, a pest house, a charnel house within, lusts, vile imaginations, and strong evil passions, which, like wells of poisonous water, send out continually streams of impurity. I have a heart, which God knows, I wish I could wring from my body and hurl to an infinite distance, a soul which is a cage of unclean birds, a den of loathsome creatures, where dragons haunt and owls do congregate, where evil beast of ill omen dwells, a heart too vile to have a parallel, deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. This is the reason why I am forgetful of Christ, nor is this the sole cause. I suspect it lies somewhere else, too. We forget Christ because there are so many other things around us to attract our attention. But, you say, they ought not to do so, because though they are around us, they are nothing in comparison with Jesus Christ. Though they are in dread proximity to our hearts, what are they compared with Christ? But do you know, dear friends, that the nearness of an object has a very great effect upon its power? The sun is many, many times larger than the moon, but the moon has a greater influence upon the tides of the ocean than the sun, simply because it is near and has a greater power of attraction. So I find that a little crawling worm of the earth has more effect upon my soul than the glorious Christ in heaven, a handful of golden earth, a puff of fame, a shout of applause, a thriving business, my house, my home, will affect me more than all the glories of the upper world. Yea, than the beatific vision itself, simply because earth is near and heaven is far away.
happy day, when I shall be borne aloft on angels' wings to dwell forever near my lord, to bask in the sunshine of his smile, and to be lost in the ineffable radiance of his lovely countenance. We see, then, the cause of forgetfulness. Let us blush over it. Let us be sad that we neglect our Lord so much, and now let us attend to his word, this do in remembrance of me, hoping that its solemn sounds may charm away the demon of base ingratitude. We shall speak, first of all, concerning the blessed object of memory, secondly, upon the advantages to be derived from remembering this person, thirdly, the gracious help to our memory, this do in remembrance of me, and fourthly, the gentle command, this do in remembrance of me. May the Holy Ghost open my lips and your hearts, that we may first receive blessings. First of all, we shall speak of the glorious and precious object of memory, this do in remembrance of me. Christians have many treasures to lock up in the cabinet of memory. They ought to remember their election, chosen of God ere time began. They ought to be mindful of their extraction that they were taken out of their merry clay, hewn out of the horrible pit. They ought to recollect their effectual calling, for they were called of God and rescued by the power of the Holy Ghost. They ought to remember their special deliverances, all that has been done for them and all the mercies bestowed on them. But there is one whom they should embalm in their souls with the most costly spices, one who, above all other gifts of God, deserves to be had in perpetual remembrance. One, I said, for I mean not an act, I mean not a deed, but it is a person whose portrait I would frame in gold and hang up in the state room of the soul. I would have you earnest students of all the deeds of the conquering Messiah. I would have you conversant with the life of our beloved. But oh, forget not his person, for the text says, this do in remembrance of me. It is Christ's glorious person which ought to be the object of our remembrance. It is his image which should be enshrined in every temple of the Holy Ghost. But some will say, how can we remember Christ's person when we never saw it? We cannot tell what was the peculiar form of his visage. We believe his countenance to be fairer than that of any other man, although through grief and suffering more marred. But since we did not see it, we cannot remember it. We never saw his feet as they trod the journeys of his mercy. We never beheld his hands as he stretched them out full of loving kindness. We cannot remember the wondrous intonation of his language when in more than seraphic eloquence he awed the multitude and chained their ears to him. We cannot picture the sweet smile that ever hung on his lips, nor that awful frown with which he dealt out anathemas against the Pharisees. We cannot remember him and his sufferings and agonies, for we never saw him. Well, beloved, I suppose it is true that you cannot remember the visible appearance, for you were not then born. But do you not know that when the apostle said, though he had known Christ after the flesh, yet thenceforth after the flesh, he would know Christ no more? The natural appearance, the race, the descent, the poverty, the humble garb were nothing in the apostle's estimation of his glorified Lord. And thus, though you do not know him after the flesh, you may know him after the spirit. In this manner, you can remember Jesus as much now as Peter or Paul or John or James or any of those favored ones who once trod in his footsteps, walked side by side with him, or laid their heads upon his bosom. Memory annihilates distance and overleaps time, and can behold the Lord, though he be exalted in glory. Ah, let us spend five minutes in remembering Jesus. Let us remember him in his baptism, when descending into the waters of Jordan, a voice was heard saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Behold him coming up, dripping from the stream. Surely the conscious water must have blushed that it contained its God. He slept within its waves a moment, to consecrate the tomb of baptism, in which those who are dead with Christ are buried with him. Let us remember him in the wilderness, whither he went straight from his immersion. Oh, I have often thought of that scene in the desert, when Christ, weary and way-worn, sat him down, perhaps upon the gnarled roots of some old tree. Forty days had he fasted, he was hungered, when in the extremity of his weakness there came the evil spirit. Perhaps he had veiled his demon royalty in the form of some aged pilgrim, and taking up a stone, said, Way-worn pilgrim, if thou be the Son of God, command this stone to be made bread. 
I think I see him with his cunning smile and his malicious leer, as he held the stone and said, If, blasphemous if, if thou be the Son of God, command that this stone shall become a meal for me and you, for both of us are hungry, and it will be an act of mercy. You can do it easily. Speak the word, and it shall be like the bread of heaven. We will feed upon it, and you and I will be friends forever. But Jesus said, and oh, how sweetly did he say it, man shall not live by bread alone. Oh, how wonderfully did Christ fight the tempter. Never was there such a battle as that. It was a duel foot to foot, a single-handed combat, when the champion lion of the pit and the mighty lion of the tribe of Judah fought together. Splendid sight. Angels stood around to gaze upon the spectacle, just as men of old did sit to see the tournament of noted warriors. There Satan gathered up his strength. Here Apollyon concentrated all his satanic power, that in this giant wrestle he might overthrow the seed of the woman. But Jesus was more than a match for him. In the wrestling he gave him a deadly fall, and came off more than a conqueror. Lamb of God, I will remember your desert strivings when next I combat with Satan, when next I have a conflict with roaring Diabolus. I will look to him who conquered once for all and broke the dragon's head with his mighty blows. Further, I beseech you remember him in all his daily temptations and hourly trials, and that lifelong struggle of his through which he passed. Oh, what a mighty tragedy was the death of Christ, and his life too. Ushered in with a song, it closed with a shriek. It is finished. It began in a manger and ended on a cross. But oh, the sad interval between. Oh, the black pictures of persecution, when his friends abhorred him, when his foes frowned at him as he passed the streets, when he heard the hiss of calumny and was bitten by the foul tooth of envy, when slander said he had a devil and was mad, that he was a drunken man and a wine-bibber, and when his righteous soul was vexed with the ways of the wicked. Oh, son of God, I must remember you. I cannot help remembering you when I think of those years of toil and trouble which you did live for my sake. But you know my chosen theme, the place where I can always best remember Christ. It is a shady garden full of olives. Oh, that spot! I would that I had eloquence, that I might take you there. Oh, if the Spirit would but take us and set us down hard by the mountains of Jerusalem, I would say, See, there runs the brook of Kidron, which the king himself did pass, and there you see the olive trees. Possibly, at the foot of that olive lay the three disciples when they slept. And there, ah, there I see drops of blood. Stand here, my soul, a moment. Those drops of blood, do you behold them? Mark them, they are not the blood of wounds, they are the blood of a man whose body was then unwounded. O oh, my soul, picture him, when he knelt down in agony and sweat. Sweat because he wrestled with God. Sweat because he agonized with his father. My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. O oh, Gethsemane! Your shades are deeply solemn to my soul. But ah, those drops of blood. Surely it is the climax of the height of misery. It is the last of the mighty acts of this wondrous sacrifice. Can love go deeper than that? Can it stoop to greater deeds of mercy? Oh, had I eloquence, I would bestow a tongue on every drop of blood that is there, that your hearts might rise in mutiny against your languor and coldness, and speak out with earnest burning remembrance of Jesus. And now, farewell, Gethsemane, but I will take you somewhere else, where you shall still behold the man of sorrows. I will lead you to Pilate's hall, and let you see him endure the mockeries of cruel soldiers, the smitings of mailed gloves, the blows of clenched fists, the shame, the spitting, the plucking of the hair, the cruel buffetings. Oh, can you not picture the king of martyrs, stripped of his garments, exposed to the gaze of fiend-like men? See you not the crown about his temples, each thorn acting as a lancet to pierce his head? Mark you not at his lacerated shoulders, and not the white bones starting out from the bleeding flesh? Oh, son of man, I see you scourged and flagellated with rods and whips. How can I henceforth cease to remember you? My memory would be more treacherous than Pilate, did it not ever cry, Ecce homo, behold the man. Now finish the scene of woe by a view of Calvary. Think of the pierced hands and the bleeding side. Think of the scorching sun and then the entire darkness. Remember the broiling fever and the dread thirst. Think of the death shriek. 
it is finished, and of the groans which were its prelude. This is the object of memory. Let us never forget Christ. I beseech you, for the love of Jesus, let him have the chief place in your memories. Let not the pearl of great price be dropped from your careless hand into the dark ocean of oblivion. I cannot, however, help saying one thing before I leave this head, and that is, there are some of you who can very well carry away what I have said, because you have read it often and heard it before, but still you cannot spiritually remember anything about Christ, because you never had him manifested to you, and what we have never known we cannot remember. Thanks be unto God, I speak not of you all, for in this place there is a goodly remnant according to the election of grace, and to them I turn. Perhaps I could tell you of some old barn, hedgerow, or cottage, or if you have lived in London, about some garret, or some dark lane or street, where first you met with Christ, or some chapel into which you strayed, and you might say, Thank God I can remember the seat where first he met with me, and spoke the whispers of love to my soul, and told me he had purchased me. Do mind the place, the spot of ground, where Jesus did thee meet. Yes, and I would love to build a temple on that spot, and to raise some monument there, where Jehovah, Jesus, first spoke to my soul, and manifested himself to me. But he has revealed himself to you more than once, has he not? And can you remember scores of places where the Lord has appeared of old unto you, saying, Behold, I have loved you with an everlasting love? If you cannot all remember such things, there are some of you that can, and I am sure they will understand me when I say, Come, and do this in remembrance of Christ, in remembrance of all his loving visitations, of his sweet wooing words, of his winning smiles upon you, of all he has said and communicated to your souls. Remember all these things tonight, if it be possible for memory to gather up the mighty aggregate of grace. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Having spoken upon the blessed object of our memory, we say, secondly, a little upon the benefits to be derived from a loving remembrance of Christ. Love never says, we, bono. Love never asks what benefit it will derive from love. Love, from its very nature, is an unselfish thing. It loves for the creature's sake it loves, and for nothing else. The Christian needs no argument to make him love Christ, just as a mother needs no argument to make her love her child. She does it because it is her nature to do so. The newborn creature must love Christ. It cannot help it. Oh, who can resist the matchless charms of Jesus Christ, the fairest of ten thousand fairs, the loveliest of ten thousand loves? Who can refuse to adore the Prince of Perfection, the Mirror of Beauty, the Majestic Son of God? But yet it may be useful to us to observe the advantages of remembering Christ, for they are neither few nor small. And first, remembrance of Jesus will tend to give you hope when you are under the burden of your sins. Let us notice a few characters here tonight. There comes in a poor creature. Look at him. He has neglected himself this last month. He looks as if he had hardly eaten his daily bread. What is the matter with you? Oh, says he, I have been under a sense of guilt. I have been again and again lamenting, because I fear I can never be forgiven. Once I thought I was good, but I have been reading the Bible, and I find that my heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. I have tried to reform, but the more I try, the deeper I sink in the mire. There is certainly no hope for me. I feel that I deserve no mercy. It seems to me that God must destroy me, for he has declared, The soul that sinneth, it shall die, and die I must, be damned I must, for I know I have broken God's law. How will you comfort such a man? What soft words will you utter to give him peace? I know. I will tell him to remember Christ. I will tell him there is one who paid the mighty debt of misery. Yes, I will tell you, drunkard, swearer, whatever you have been, I will tell you that there is one who for you has made a complete atonement. If you only believe on him, you are safe forever. Remember him, you poor, dying, hopeless creature, and you shall be made to sing for joy and gladness. See the man believes, and in ecstasy exclaims, Oh, come all you that fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. Tell it unto sinners, Tell, I am, I am out of hell. Hallelujah. God has blotted out my sins like a thick cloud. 
That is one benefit to be derived from remembering Christ. It gives us hope under a sense of sin and tells us there is mercy yet. Now, I must have another character. And what does he say? I cannot stand it any longer. I have been persecuted and ill-treated because I love Christ. I am mocked and laughed at and despised. I try to bear it, but I really cannot. A man will be a man, tread upon a worm, and he will turn upon you. My patience altogether fails me. I am in such a peculiar position that it is of no use to advise me to have patience, for patience I cannot have. My enemies are slandering me, and I do not know what to do. What shall we say to that poor man? How shall we give him patience? What shall we preach to him? You have heard what he has to say about himself. How shall we comfort him under this great trial? If we suffered the same, what should we wish some friend to say to us? Shall we tell him that other persons have borne as much? He will say, Miserable comforters are ye all. No, I will tell him, Brother, you are persecuted. But remember the words of Jesus Christ, how he spoke unto us and said, Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets that were before you. My brother, I think of him who, when he died, prayed for his murderers and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. All you have to bear is as nothing compared with his mighty sufferings. Take courage, face it again like a man, never say die. Let not your patience be gone. Take up your cross daily and follow Christ. Let him be your motto. Set him before your eyes. And now, receiving this, hear what the man will say. He tells you at once, Hail, persecution! Welcome, shame! Disgrace for Jesus shall be my honor, and scorn shall be my highest glory. Now, for the love I bear his name, what was my gain I count my loss. I pour contempt on all my shame, and nail my glory to his cross. There is another effect, you see, of remembering Christ. It tends to give us patience under persecution. It is a girdle to brace up the loins, so that our faith may endure to the end. Dear friends, I should occupy your time too much if I went into the several benefits. So I will only just run over one or two blessings to be received. It will give us strength in temptation. I believe that there are hours with every man when he has a season of terrific temptation. There was never a vessel that lived upon the mighty deep, but sometimes it has to do battle with a storm. There she is, the poor bark, rocked up and down on the mad waves. See how they throw her from wave to wave. All toss her to mid-heaven. The winds laugh her to scorn. Old ocean takes the ship in his dripping fingers and shakes it to and fro. How the mariners cry out for fear. Do you know how you can put oil upon the waters and all shall be still? Yes, one potent word shall do it. Let Jesus come. Let the poor heart remember Jesus, and steadily then the ship shall sail, for Christ has the helm. The winds shall blow no more, for Christ shall bid them shut their mighty mouths and never again disturb his child. There is nothing in which can give you strength and temptation and help you to weather the storm like the name of Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God. Then again, what comfort it will give you on a sickbed, the name of Christ. It will help you to be patient to those who wait upon you and to endure the sufferings which you have to bear. Yea, it shall be so with you that you shall have more hope in sickness than in health and shall find a blessed sweetness in the bitterness of gall. Instead of feeling vinegar in your mouth through your trouble, you shall find honey for sweetness in the midst of all the trial and trouble that God will put upon you, for he giveth songs in the night. But just to close up the advantages of remembering Christ, do you know where you will have the benefit most of all? Do you know the place where you chiefly will rejoice that you ever thought of him? I will take you to it. Hush! Silence! You are going upstairs into a lonely room. The curtains hang down. Someone stands there weeping. Children are around the bed, and friends are there. See that man lying? That is yourself. Look at him. His eyes are your eyes. His hands are your hands. That is yourself. You will be there soon. Man, that is yourself. Do you see it? It is a picture of yourself. Those are your eyes that soon will be closed in death, your hands that will lie stiff and motionless, your lips that will be dry and parched, between which they will put drops of water. 
Those are your words that freeze in air and drop so slowly from your dying lips. I wonder whether you will be able to remember Christ there. If you do not, I will picture you. Behold that man, straight up in the bed, see his eyes starting from their sockets. His friends are all alarmed. They ask him what he sees. He represses the emotion. He tells them he sees nothing. They know that there is something before his eyes. He starts again. What is that I see? I seem to see. What is it? Ah, one sigh. The soul is gone. The body is there. What did he see? He saw a flaming throne of judgment. He saw God upon it with his scepter. He saw books opened. He beheld the throne of God and saw a messenger with a sword brandished in the air to smite him low. Man, that is yourself. There you will be soon. That picture is your own portrait. I have photographed you to the life. Look at it. That is where you shall be within a few years, a within a few days. But if you can remember Christ, shall I tell you what you will do? Oh, you will smile in the midst of trouble. Let me picture such a man. They put pillows behind him. He sits up in a bed and takes the hand of his loved one and says, Farewell. Weep not for me. The kind God shall wipe away all tears from every eye. Those round about are addressed. Prepare to meet your God and follow me to the land of bliss. Now he has set his house in order. All is done. Behold him, like good old Jacob, leaning on his staff, about to die. See how his eyes sparkle. He claps his hands. They gather round to hear what he has to say. He whispers, Victory! And summoning a little more strength, he cries, Victory! And at last, with his final gasp, Victory! Through him that loved us. And he dies. This is one of the great benefits to be derived from remembering Christ, to be enabled to meet death with blessed composure. We are now arrived at the third portion of our meditation, which is a sweet aid to memory. At schools, we use certain books called Aids to Memory. I am sure they rather perplexed than assisted me. Their utility was equivalent to that of a bundle of staves under a traveler's arm. True, he might use them one by one to walk with, but in the meantime, he carried a host of others which he would never need. But our Savior was wiser than all our teachers, and his remembrancers are true and real aids to memory. His love tokens have an unmistakable language, and they sweetly win our attention. Behold, the whole mystery of the sacred Eucharist. It is bread and wine which are lively emblems of the body and blood of Jesus. The power to excite remembrance consists in the appeal thus made to the senses. Here the eye, the hand, the mouth find joyful work. The bread is tasted, and entering within works upon the sense of taste, which is one of the most powerful. The wine is sipped, the act is palpable. We know that we are drinking, and thus the senses, which are usually clogs to the soul, become wings to lift the mind in contemplation. Again, much of the influence of this ordinance is found in its simplicity. How beautifully simple the ceremony is, bread broken and wine poured out. There is no calling that a thing chalice, that a thing patent, and that a host. Here is nothing to burden the memory. Here is the simple bread and wine. He must have no memory at all who cannot remember that he has eaten bread and that he has been drinking wine. Note again the mighty pregnancy of these signs, how full they are of meaning. Bread broken, so was your Savior broken. Bread to be eaten, so his flesh is meat indeed. Wine poured out, the pressed juice of the grape. So was your Savior crushed under the foot of divine justice. His blood is your sweetest wine. Wine to cheer your heart, so does the blood of Jesus. Wine to strengthen and invigorate you, so does the blood of the mighty sacrifice. Oh, make that bread and wine to your souls tonight a sweet and blessed help of remembrance of that dear man who once on Calvary died. Like the little ewe lamb, you are now to eat your master's bread and drink from his cup. Remember the hand which feeds you. But before you can remember Christ well here, you must ask the assistance of the Holy Spirit. I believe there ought to be a preparation before the Lord's Supper. I do not believe in Miss Too Good's preparation, who spent a week in preparing and then finding it was not the ordinance Sunday. She said she had lost all the week. I do not believe in that kind of preparation, but I do believe in a holy preparation for the Lord's Supper. When we can on a Saturday, if possible, spend an hour in quiet meditation on Christ 
and the passion of Jesus, when, especially on the Sabbath afternoon, we can devoutly sit down and behold him. Then these scenes become realities and not mockeries, as they are to some. I fear greatly that there are some of you who will eat the bread tonight and you will not think about Christ. Some of you who will drink the wine and not think of his blood, and vile hypocrites you will be while you do it. Take heed to yourselves. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh what? Damnation to himself. This is a plain English word. Mind what you are doing. Do not do it carelessly for all the sacred things on earth. It is the most solemn. We have heard of some men banded together by drawing blood from their arms and drinking it all around. That was most horrid, but at the same time, most solemn. Here you are to drink blood from the veins of Christ and sip the trickling stream which gushed from his own loving heart. Is not that a solemn thing? Ought anybody to trifle with it? To go to church and take it for sixpence? To come and join us for the sake of getting charities? Out upon it! It is an awful blasphemy against Almighty God and amongst the damned in hell. Those shall be among the most accursed, who dared thus to mock the holy ordinance of God. This is the remembrance of Christ. This do in remembrance of me. If you cannot do it in remembrance of Christ, I beseech you, as you love your souls, do not do it at all. O oh, regenerate man or woman, enter not into the court of the priest, lest Israel's God resent the intrusion. And now to close up, here is a sweet command. This do in remembrance of me. To whom does this command apply? This do ye. It is important to answer this question. This do ye. Who are intended? You who put your trust in me. This do you in remembrance of me. Well, now, you should suppose Christ speaking to you tonight, and he says, This do ye in remembrance of me. Christ watches you at the door. Some of you go home, and Christ says, I thought I said, this do ye in remembrance of me. Some of you keep your seats as spectators. Christ sits with you and he says, I thought I said, this do ye in remembrance of me. Lord, I know you did. Do you love me then? Yes, I love you. You I love, Lord. You know I do. But, I say, go down there. Eat that bread. Drink that wine. I do not like to, Lord. I should have to be baptized if I join that church. And I am afraid I shall catch cold or be looked at. I am afraid to go before the church, for I think they would ask some questions I could not answer. What? says Christ. Is this all you love me? Is this all your affection to your Lord? Oh, how cold to me, your Savior. If I had loved you no more than this, you would have been in hell. If that were the full extent of my affection, I should not have died for you. Great love bore great agonies, and is this all your gratitude to me? Are not some of you ashamed after this? Do you not say in your hearts, is it really wrong? Christ says, do this in remembrance of me. And are you not ashamed to stay away? I would give you a free invitation to every lover of Jesus to come to this table. I beseech you, deny not yourselves the privilege by refusing to unite with the church. If you still live in sinful neglect of this ordinance, let me remind you that Christ has said, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me in this generation, of him will I be ashamed when I come in the glory of my Father. O oh, soldier of the cross, act not the coward's part, and not to lead you into any mistakes. I must just add one thing, and then I have done. When I speak of your taking the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, do not imagine that I wish you for one moment to suppose that there is anything saving in it. Some say that the ordinance of baptism is not essential, so is the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. It is not essential if we look upon it in the light of salvation. Be saved by eating a piece of bread? Nonsense! Confounded nonsense! Be saved by drinking a drop of wine? Why, it is too absurd for common sense to admit any discussion upon. You know it is the blood of Jesus Christ. It is the merit of his agonies. It is the purchase of his sufferings. It is what he did that alone can save us. Venture on him, venture wholly, and then you are saved. Hear you, poor convinced sinner, the way of salvation? If I ever meet you in the next world, you might perhaps say to me, I spent one evening, sir, in hearing you, and you never told me the way to heaven. Well, you shall hear it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in his name. Find refuge in his cross. Rely upon the power of his spirit. 
trust in his righteousness, and you are saved beyond the vengeance of the law or the power of hell. But trust in your own works, and you are lost as sure as you are alive. Now, O ever-glorious Son of God, we approach your table to feast on the viands of grace. Permit each of us, in reliance upon your Spirit, to exclaim in the words of one of your own poets, And all thy love to me, yes, while a pulse or breath remains, I will remember thee. And when these failing lips grow dumb, and thought and memory flee, when thou shalt in thy kingdom come, Jesus, remember me.